Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest podcast. And this is going to be a one-parter. And I had the opportunity to present last week at an MIT symposium run by the Lust Garden Foundation and Stand Up to Cancer Foundation, where they were looking at the role of deep learning in pancreatic cancer. And their concern or their question was, is there more they can do? And so what I did is I presented part of the work we're doing at Hopkins on using deep learning for detection of pancreatic cancer. And Alan Yuley, who is in charge of the computer side of things from computer vision and computer science at Hopkins, gave a part two where he went into more detail. So I'll just tell you what um, we're doing. The first thing is you see from the title slide and there's other people involved, Linda Chu from radiology and Tommy Kawamoto and a cast of thousands. But you can see that when you're doing deep learning, you need a deep group of people to make it work. So what was the problem? The problem is very simple. Can we improve the early detection of pancreatic cancer in order to improve patient outcomes? We know that less than 20% of patients at time of presentation are resectable. We know that there's a 7% five-year survival in pancreatic cancer. And we know pancreatic cancer is a third leading cause of cancer-related deaths. And we seem not to be making a lot of progress. We know that our experience and many people's experience is that many things are missed early. Now, I will admit the requisitions don't say rule out pancreatic cancer. They say weight loss, uh, discomfort, um, vague pain. But there it is. There's a pancreatic cancer. And if you don't recognize it, six months later when the patient has more symptoms, they have metastatic disease or vessel involvement. We know from our experience as a multidisciplinary clinic at Hopkins, about 25% of percent of patients will have change in their management, and a high proportion of these, maybe 80%, relate to imaging. Now, we always do dual phase imaging with 3D mapping, so we see more things, we change, we upstage, we downstage, we change the diagnosis from pancreatic cancer to autoimmune pancreatitis, we change what might be an adenocarcinoma to a neuroendocrine tumor. There's many things we change, but we are changing the management of these patients. Another article by Gerritsen made the point, the specificity for malignancy of pancreatic masses was identified in expert consensus twice as high compared with the initial CT report. The uh, PPV increased to 98% after expert consensus and the negative predictive value was low for both the original CT and expert consensus. But you can see that people who have a lot of experience can do a lot better. Now we knew, and we've published about this, this article by Karen Horton eight years ago, advancements in CT and 3D imaging have improved our ability to detect and characterize pancreatic pathology. However, we see avoidable errors made by radiologists over and over whether it's failure to identify a mass, misdiagnosis of extrapancreatic structures as pancreatic neoplasms, or mischaracterization of a lesion as malignant when it's in fact benign. We need to do better. This article by Al Haraway, uh, Multidisciplinary Abdominal Radiology Society, American Pancreatic Association, this focused on trying to have a consensus report, but the key thing I walk away from the article is that it made the point that if you want a consensus report, you need to have a well-defined protocol. And unless you do multiplanar, unless you do 3D, unless you do dual phase imaging, the quality of the study is not gonna be where it needs to be, and you're gonna have error. So how you do the study is first, then you need to be able to interpret it correctly. Now, in our uh, deep learning, what you're trying to do is train the computer to be able to be the best CT reader in the universe. We think about the things we all look at, size and shape and enhancement, adjacent structures, whether it's the pancreatic or common duct, adjacent vasculature, but also something we look at but don't think about perhaps is texture. And as we started spending time with cinematic rendering, as you can see from these images, you have incredible texture detail of the pancreas, of the spleen, the kidneys, the mesenteric vessels, and here's one more set of images. And perhaps before you see a mass, you're gonna be able to see texture change. And that texture change 
is something computers do really well. So if we can teach the computer to look at texture, we can teach the computer to detect early lesions. Now this is a sad case, just a few months apart. You have a patient on the, on the left, and you can see as we scroll through the images, this was read as negative. But if you look hard, there's a slightly dilated pancreatic duct, and there seems like something going on in the body of the pancreas. Of course, when you go forward just a few months later, widespread liver mats, big mass, vessel encasement, unresectable. And here are the two images that kind of match. Again, if you stare at the image on the left, you sort of see a dilated duct and there's some textural change. If you did cinematic rendering, you see the textural change earlier. It's subtle, but it's there. And you would have been suspicious and you would have done EUS and biopsy and the patient would have been resected. Here it is, of course, a few months later where the mass is necrotic, but you also see the textural changes, of course, it's more impressive at this point, and we want to detect it on the prior scan, but again, making the point that texture analysis becomes very critical. Or in this example, nothing very fancy, coronal views, tumor in the body of the pancreas near neck, obstructing the pancreatic duct, and look at the cinematic, look at the changes in the head of the pancreas, which looks normal, but then you see the dilated duct and you see the textural changes in the body of the pancreas, classic pancreatic carcinoma. And look how obvious the textural changes are from normal to abnormal gland. So one of the things we think about is this idea of texture. And in this same patient, look at this example where you can see the textural change. You see the vascular map because I'm showing you the arterial map. But look at that textural change of the mass, the normal enhancing head, the duodenum, the SMV, the uh, SMA, all of that in one picture. And again, think about the computer being able to analyze that. It should do incredibly well. And here's just a couple more images showing you that. But again, this is a coronal display, volume rendering using cinematic volume rendering. <clears throat> but look how nicely you can see the texture the changes, the subtleties. And I think we can do better than we've been doing to date. And this article we wrote, uh, or it's actually in press now on pancreatic uh, cancer and cinematic rendering, photorealistic quality of cinematic rendering can accentuate subtle textural change of the pancreatic parenchyma, which can improve visualization of subtle cases. It provides greater appreciation of the global shape and size of the pancreas, highlights atrophy, photorealistic images of cinematic mimic real anatomic specimens that may be more intuitive for non-radiologists and may facilitate communication between referring physicians and radiologists. That's true, the last statement, but also I'm saying is those subtleties are gonna help our diagnosis. If you're missing 30% of cases, which is the number reported, this only can help you. And we also, and again, this is beyond the scope of the lecture, you see the one sodomine cystic lesion in the body of the pancreas? That shell is an appearance we are seeing with neuroendocrine tumors. So not only can we lose texture to detect tumors early, but we can use texture characteristics to define the various types of tumors. Now again, when we talk about mistakes, as I mentioned a few moments ago, there are a number of things we look for but small masses always are going to be the problem. And that's where we need the deep learning. So we did is we took patients who were renal donors. We segmented 23 structures from diaphragm to iliac crests. We looked at arterial and venous phase imaging. We used velocity software from Varian. Here's a good example of the individual segmentations, whether it's liver or stomach or spleen, portal vein, SMV, adrenal, and kidneys. And you can see we did that, and here it is in the, cor in the um, coronal plane as well as the axial plane. And if I made a 3D of that, here's specifically how it would look. Now, with these normals, we trained the computer to recognize normal pancreas. We also trained it to recognize all the organs and vessels and everything in the abdomen. Now, initially, to move things along, there was a lot of push to do only the pancreas because who cares about the rest of the stuff? Well, we felt very strongly that to do the pancreas well, you needed all the organs and that although it was painful in the short term, 
it was ideal in the long term. And you can see here's an image, a CT slice, there's manual segmentation, and there's the deep network prediction. More accurate than our manual segmentation. And so we're able to now look carefully at the various structures. When you look at the pancreas, again, image to annotation. Annotation is us. That's the computer prediction. Looks one to one. Or here we have the patient's splenic vein and portal vein in the picture. Look how nicely the annotation separates the vessels and look how nicely the prediction model is. So you can see that after one year, we could find the pancreas, isolate the pancreas, segment the pancreas, show the pancreas as well its nearest 22 friends. So then we said, okay, we can find the pancreas. Now let's find tumors. So our goal is to look at 1,000 pancreatic adenocarcinomas. We're up to over 700. And the same thing, we need to train the computer, outline all of the organs, then outline the tumor. Just to tell you, this takes about four hours. It's painful, it's expensive, but it is critical to the success of our endeavor. And here it is again, a small tumor. You can see it in red, and you can see very nicely the coronal and sagittal views of that. Now, I mentioned Alan Yuli spoke about the details of how we analyze the data, but I'll just tell you a few points. One is we use a course to find pancreatic detection algorithm. We developed an algorithm which defined and detected the pancreas in a coarse way, so you saw most of the boundaries, and then you analyze the individual parts to really focus on the details of the gland, and this course to find is very good for helping you look for changes in the gland, such as tumor, and you can see here the prediction model in 3D, as well as the ground truth. We also looked at geometry. Remember, the pancreas has a shape. You need to be careful because it's variable, <clears throat> there's variable normal shapes. But a key thing is to look and say, well, if the shape changes, perhaps there's pathology present. There's a mass off the pancreas, the mass in the tail, mass in the head. So geometry becomes very important, but geometry alone can be somewhat problematic. And so it's used with this fine to course, as well as several other algorithms we have implemented. You can see that we're getting there. CT, ground truth is us reading it, prediction and overlay. Look at the ground truth of this patient's tumor in the body and tail of pancreas. Look at the prediction model of both the tumor as well as the normal gland. And you can see the prediction is one to one. Or this example, ground truth, we see a tail pancreas lesion under 2CM shown on ground truth prediction model with overlay shows the lesion very nicely. So you can see that we're able to see pancreatic masses and we have the computer now not only recognizing the pancreas but recognizing the pathology in the pancreatic gland, something that would seem to be very hard. And if you look and think about it, it's not the only thing we can do. So Young Park, Satomi Kawamoto, Linda True, are working on radiomics, which is the correlation between imaging appearance of cancer and the gen genomics of such. And again, what we're looking at is specific features. Can we predict what a lesion is? Can we predict what's cancer? Can we predict what's a neuroendocrine tumor? Can we eventually predict what's the grade of tumors? Can we do this? And perhaps we can do this using AI in a way to make it faster. So you have input, you have that you outline the pancreas, you outline what is the mass, this feature extraction, the shape, texture, you run a number of filters, then you analyze the data, trying to figure out what pattern is coming out of that analysis. And, and so in this case, we looked at 488 features, we looked at demographic features, age and gender, there was minimal redundancy, maximum relevancy in the feature reduction, and a random forest technique was used. And you can see the images and how you go from those raw data of the radiomics feature to clustering and covariance. You look at a lot of different features. Age was one of them, but you're not doing computer analysis of that. But mean intensity, cyst, appearance, and the like. And when you do this, it's amazing some of the results. Initial work, normal cases, 190, 
pancreatic adenocarcinoma 190, that's the training cases. And you can see just some of the comments about the imaging. And then you go and you get more cases and you do normal versus abnormal. The classification method was a random forest. And your classification results were that 98% of tumors were classified correctly. And the sensitivity was 96.8%. So high specificity, high sensitivity is something we need. And again, you don't want to be missing tumors. And we're doing a good job. We're trying hard, but we're not doing good enough. And again, with the variability of various readers, at Hopkins, we look at 10, 20 cases a day. You're going to be good at it. Some other places, you're not doing that many. At Hopkins, we do 450 whipples a year. A high volume center is five whipples. So you just don't see things. So it's hard to blame people for things they don't see. This idea about massive data sets, computer vision, will drive improvement in performance. We are not suggesting that radiologists will be eliminated and will be working at uh, McDonald's. What we're saying is our jobs will change. We need the computer to make us more accurate, make us quicker at what we do, and push the entire process along. So our experience has been very, very positive. We're doing great things on a weekly basis, or uh, Alan Yuli and his team is. So we're looking ahead to when pancreatic cancer will be diagnosed early or earlier than we've ever been able to do it with computer-assisted imaging. So it's very excited. Deep learning and AI is here to stay, and we are telling you that we will be there with you at the front lines. And with that, see you next week.